Okay, perfect. All right. So, welcome everyone again. So, it's glad, we're glad to have you back. Today's talk is about the role of active brain rights in learning. We have great speakers today. I'm really excited about it. So, just to give some background, uh, Brains at Bay is a machine learning uh, meets neuroscience meetup that started last year in the Bay Area. It's now online. And the idea is to discuss brain hard uh, machine learning algorithms, both, both from the perspective of neuroscience and machine learning researchers. So we had previous meetups on lat lateral connections, predictive processing, having learning, sparse representation, and continual learning. And we will keep doing this every time with a different topic. So if you have uh, some feedback or suggestions for next topics or speakers, uh, please leave a message at the meetup or send me an email. So in our agenda today, we have uh, Matthew Larkin from Larkin Lab, and then Lena Jones from Coding Lab, Blake Richards from Link Lab, and finally we have a discussion panel um, where we're going to exchange some ideas. The talks will be recorded and made available later on YouTube. And I wanted to ask the panelists, uh, do anyone, does anyone have an issue recording the talks? Or is that okay? Matthew, Lena, or Blake? Fine with me. Okay. Fine with me. So the preferred way, so we had to move to the webinar format in Zoom because of the number of attendees. So the preferred way to ask questions is through the question and answer feature. There is an option to ask a question and you can also vote on existing ones. So we try to answer some of the questions during the talk, but most of the questions will be addressed in the panel. And if you'd rather ask the question in person, just send me a direct message in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat and then I can promote you to panelists and then you can ask it. And I won't spend a lot of time introducing the topic because we have great speakers. I just leave this cartoon here to introduce the topic of the entry. So, Matthew, do you want to go ahead? All right. So, I'll share my screen. No, I can't do it yet. So, I just uh, give a brief bio if you, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Matthew Larkin. Uh, I got from your CV, so <laughs> let me know if something's wrong. Uh, graduated from Sydney University, was a postdoc for six years in the laboratory of the Nobel Prize winner Bert Sackman. And he's now a principal investigator of the Larkin Lab at the Neuroscience Research, Research Center in Humboldt University of Berlin. Now, Professor Matt is recognized as one of the leading experts in the whole of, role of dendrites in learning, and we're really happy to have you here. So, thank you. Oh, thanks. Okay, now I can share my screen. Do you see my screen? Yeah, we can see. Yep, excellent. Great. Okay, well, uh, thanks for inviting me. I was quite excited to get the invitation from Subutai. I couldn't do it at the time because we were cycling over the Alps with our family. Went from Munich to, to Venice, which was kind of nice. So that's oh. why I turned it out at the time. Um, so, I do click on that screen so I can move on. Um, so the, the, the topic is the role of active dendrites in learning. And, um, and so on the website, it says, first, Matthew, a leading expert on dendrites. Thanks for that, Tupatai. We'll give an overview on the main advances in active dendrites over the last two decades. And that in 30 minutes. So um, I thought about exactly how you, you, you present all the main advances in active dendrites over the last two decades. Um, and I decided that that's going to be a difficult one, but I got some help from Subutai who said it would be great. He gave me this email, I think it was last night or the night before. It'd be great if you could review the main issues in a way that is accessible to a variety of backgrounds before describing your latest work. Um, well, uh, what I thought I'd do to, rather than go over all the main advances was to stick to the topic and and give just what I think are the, the two main advances or the top two main advances in my opinion. And number one, in my opinion, would be NMDA spikes. And number two is a more recent thing, behavioral time scale plasticity or BTSP as it's becoming known. And then hopefully I've still got time to talk about my data. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about, um, I'll try to keep on topic to the active dendrites and learning. Um, have to admit that there was a little bit, a tinge of regret in uh, 
focusing on active gender rights and learning, not, not because um, there's, uh, I'm not excited by this topic. In fact, quite the opposite. I think uh, we're, we're, we're now closing on something that's new for the lab and, and really important um, for us. But 2020 has been a good year for us in terms of closing a whole lot of um, projects. So we've, uh, there's been a bunch of papers come out that I think uh, are, are justifying our original take on, or theory you could say, of what the, how the dendrites contribute to, um, to cognition. And in, in point of fact now, it seems to be linked to all sorts of things. These are a, a spread of the, the things that have come out this year. And, and really, I feel like I could give a talk on any one of these papers for half an hour or an hour. Um, and, and none of these topics are on learning. And um, it's nonetheless, and, and I should say, we, we haven't actually published anything on, on den rights and learning at this point. But uh, don't despair, we, we do actually have a, uh, a preprint on bioarchive and that's what I'll talk about now. So in fact, it's the, the very latest stuff that, uh, that I hope I can get around to. So, and I think this has really only been possible to get where we are today because we've had really a dream team of, of scientists and the, the, the five people you see here plus a whole lot of other people in the lab have been just an incredible team of people. I, I, from, from my money, um, never really come across this conglomeration of, of fantastic scientists. So I'm really grateful and honoured in a way just to have been in this kind of a milieu. Nevertheless, um, well, I should say uh, two of these have already left the lab this year. Naoya and Jan have gone off to start their own labs. And by the way, they're looking for postdocs and PhD students if there are any people in the audience who are interested. But, but I'll focus on, a, on as I said, a, a study that's unpublished at this point that is on um, dendrites and learning and, uh, and highlights, I think, also the role of layer one in, in the cortex. And, and this has been the work of Guy Doran and Jiun Shin. Uh, Jiun Shin's a PhD student in the lab. Okay, so just a bit of background and going over uh, actually more than the last two decades. I, I, in my opinion, um, a, a really important player in the, in, in the story of what becomes now NMDA spikes was Bartlett Mel. And here's an early paper from Bartlett Mel and Christoph Koch, who were looking at what they called Sigma Pi learning. Um, and, and, and that really, I think, captures the, the notion that if, if you include dendrites, in the computational process, then you can do more than just add up inputs. You can you can do more duplicative functions, and you can combine these with you can essentially add up dendrites, and so you can get a an additive and a multiplicative kind of function out of dendrites, which is already a, a big complication, and and I think a, a really important observation that was being made way back now, three decades ago, and um, and it all depends in that sense on on the clusters of synaptic inputs. And that word cluster becomes, I think, a, a, an important concept going forward. Um, and Bartlett published a lot in the early 90s in, on, on this concept. And I think he was way ahead of the curve here. Um, and this is another paper in, in the same journal that came out two years later, where he brought forward the, the notion of what he called the cluster on, which is a, a model, basically a collapsing of the dendrites into one dendrite where you can have a, let's say, an abstraction of, of the synaptic inputs. And the point about this is that it introduces space into the com computational process, whereas uh, a, a point neuron doesn't have space. It just, it doesn't care which order the, the, the synaptic inputs come but in a cluster on you care about the location or, or each you could say each each synaptic input is labeled and he also recognized early on the importance of the nmda channel in in this whole edifice of, of um, keeping track of where the inputs are and that also becomes an important concept um, and actually Bartlemel is still going on 
on more or less well, say the same topic. It's got it's got along further, a lot further since three decades ago. But but he's still really chasing after these these concepts. Um, so I'm referring now back to the Gordon Conference last year on dendrites, which was held in Ventura the end of March, beginning of April. Uh, sound, that feels like just another century ago now, doesn't it? But um, so he was in the session on dendritic input clustering and computation and gave a talk on the conditions that maximize the spatial dimensionality of dendritic computation. And, and he's still looking into this topic and it's still very um, fruitful and, and producing lots of really important insights. Just another two years after that, he brought out, I think, a, a really present review on, on information processing in dendritic trees. This particular picture on the right is used pretty well in, in every conference on dendrites. And, and he was basically highlighting the fact that nobody, at least at that time, took account of the real shape of, of neurons and, and nobody seemed to care about um, the, the possibility that there were really important computations going on in dendrites. Um, and an interesting anecdote, right at the end of that paper, he says, we're at present in an awkward period where many of the new ideas relating to dendritic function are, are the products of modeling studies, but where limited experimental access to dendritic trees means that modeling work proceeds mostly without direct experimental support, which was a, um, a present thing to say at the time, and and it was um, in in 1994, in the same year that Stuart and Sackman published what was really a revolutionary paper, um, showing the first direct patches, de uh, patch recordings from the dendritic tree and the soma at the same time, and this revolutionised the experimental side of the study of dendrites. Uh, because all of a sudden you could ask what are the computational properties of dendrites and, and probe that question experimentally. And that kicked off a whole lot of um, subsequent studies. And, and for my money, actually, uh, ironically, um, after what Bartlett was saying in the very same year, uh, it, I would say that the experimentalists, to some extent, took over. And, and unfortunately, there's been, in my opinion, a dearth of, of modelers and theoretical neuroscientists, those, those uh, that are speaking today accepted, um, and of course, new mentor. Um, but, but basically, I, I think um, modelers who, who actually consider the complexity of real neurons are few and far between at the moment. So in the meantime, there's been different ways to try to encapsulate the, the properties of, of real neurons. I won't dwell too much on this, but uh, I'll just um, flick through here um, various studies that have come out in the meantime. Um, and you can see these are different formalisms, if you like, of, of, of trying to capture the properties of dendrites. And, and in the end, I think what, uh, what the sensible thing to try to do in this, in, in, in this situation is to not just to simulate the whole um, neuron per se, but to try to reduce it, um, which is by, by which this word encapsulated is driving it, to try to reduce it to its essence so that you, you don't have to simulate every aspect of the neuron. In other words, capture what's really important about the dendrites and the, uh, and the computational process. Well, so um, I, I visited Numenta I think in 2015, and we had some really fantastic discussions. And, and um, I think it was already clear, actually, from Jeff's book on intelligence, um, was that 2004, I think, that, um, that, that he already was uh, focused on trying to derive properties from the brain and to understand the brain and, and to learn from that, um, which I think uh, makes Jeff stand out in a, in a crowd because it's, 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 um, I think these, these properties derived from single neurons, it's, it's still an unusual thing to do. Um, and here is a recent paper entitled why neurons have thousands of synapses, a theory of sequence memory in neocortex. And there again, I think that's, um, trying to in, embed memory into the edifice of, of real neurons is also out there. And, and uh, I shouldn't say um, memory, but uh, sequences and, and time is, is something that is um, 
that is unusual. But here um, in this particular figure, um, you can see the, the standard model for a, for a neuron that's used. And, and it's really, in my opinion, surprising just how many models rely on, on this um, formalization of a neuron, given what we know about neurons after now two and a half decades of, of recording from their dendrites and, and their computational properties. And, and I, 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 I sense that, um, that Numantor and Jeff and, and Subutai and others are, are now are now probing this and, and making inroads into that. You can see that on the second figure here, there's something that's dear to my heart, which is the pyramidal neuron and, and already the, the fact that there's some segregation of categories of input. Here, feedback comes predominantly to the top of the neuron and feed forward to the bottom. And that's something that I focused a lot on in, in my research um, and, and something that we're, we're now really making inroads with in, in the recent work that I was just um, alluding to. And then this last figure, I think is really important. You can see in a way, these, these are multiple clusterons, if you like, that are added to the, to the dendrites and, and is, is showing that if you take care of space, then you have um, a whole lot of new dimensions or parameters or possibilities that a single neuron can do. And I think Elaine is gonna talk a lot about that later on, but I, I don't exactly know what her, talk is, but given the title, that sounds likely. Um, so the, in that, this paper that I'm alluding to, um, Jeff and Subutai say, it's come to think of a neuron as computing a single weighted sum of all of its sciences. This notion sometimes called a point neuron, that's this, this thing in A, forms the basis of almost all artificial neural networks. Active dendrites suggest a different view of the neuron, where neurons recognize many independent unique patterns. Experimental results showed that the show that the coincident activation of about eight to 20 synapses in close spatial proximity on a dendrite will combine in a nonlinear fashion and cause an NMDA spike. Thus, a small set of neighboring synapses act as a pattern detector. It follows that the thousands of synapses on a cell's dendrite act as a set of independent pattern detectors. The detection of any of these patterns causes an NMDA spike and subsequent depolarization of the soma. So I think they absolutely nailed it with that, better than I could have put it. And, and it's something I think that's missing, not just in, in theoretical neuroscience or, or, or let's say machine learning, but, but also amongst the vast majority of, of neurobiologists who, who also like to ignore um, the, the spatial component of synaptic input by and large. And, and I would say avoid the term dendritic spike, for instance, uh, an NMDA spike, I should say. And uh, the, it, it's still, I think, not a, uh, a term that, that you can just drop in polite company. Uh, you have to justify this and, and, uh, and, and insist that, that, it's, that it's even a, a thing that, that exists, despite what I would say is manifest evidence. So I'll go through some of that evidence now. Um, but in this same paper, before I do that, um, there's this, this uh, schema that I guess that if you're, if you're coming to this talk, a lot of you will have seen this kind of um, diagram before. Um, and, and I think it's, it's what it's showing is the, the attention that um, Jeff and Supertai put on um, recognizing that the apical dendrites actually have a function and also that there, there, are, um, there are important inputs coming to this part of the dendrite. So we'll, we'll get back to that in, in the second part of this talk. So NMDA spikes, um, they really came on the scene but from this paper around 2000 and Jackie Schiller was the, the, the driving force. And she later combined with, with Bartlett Mill a lot in, in, uh, and still does on, on uh, trying to describe how, what consequences this have. But essentially an NMDA spike is, is a spike that comes from the fact that NMDA channels are actually also voltage sensitive. Um, but of course they are also at the same time receptors. And, and that's what's so important about an NMDA spike that there, there are two gates or, or two conditions that have to be on for them to work. But when, when these two conditions, that's to say depolarization and, and uh, transmitter molecule glutamate, but, but when these receptors bind glutamate and there's depolarization, now they can act as um, voltage sensitive channels and they can go AWOL and, uh, and you can get 
a spike. Um, but now the important point about it, it requiring a transmitter is that it can't spread like say a sodium spike or a calcium spike because it can only spread as far as the transmitter is available. So it's really tracking uh, the, the, uh, the limit of, of the synaptic input and that's where clustered input comes in. So unlike a sodium spike, which will just keep on propagating as long as the density of sodium channels is, is high enough. This is not just dependent on the de density of, of uh, NMDA channels, but it's dependent on the density of, of glutamate. And that's, uh, as I say, where clusters come in. I have to go fast. So let me, let me go uh, really quickly through the, this is work that I then uh, did in collaboration with Jackie Schiller. And we started to look to see whether or not you could get NMDA spikes in the tufts of the big pyramidal cells of the, of the neocortex. And you can see we're doing um, really difficult dendritic patches with extracellular stimulation of the tissue, this in slices, um, and trying to see whether or not these tough dendrites could, uh, could evoke NMDA spikes. And um, I won't dwell too much. You just have to believe me if you, if you find this difficult to interpret. But basically, the, the, the blue lines here are recordings coming from the blue electrode and the red lines from the red, red electrode. And, and you can see nonlinearity is occurring here, which, which is the NMDA spike. And we could do this with synaptic stimulation. We could block it with a, with a blocker for NMDA channels. So we could show that it's uh, NMDA sensitive. And importantly, in this case, which is the gold standard way of showing an NMDA spike, we could do it by uncaging. That's what this, this blitz of light is, is indicating. We could uncage glutamate um, and, and cause the, the, these spikes to occur, even when we blocked every other channel. That's why it's the gold standard. So, so the only way for this to occur is, is, uh, is through NMDA channels because um, it couldn't be through any of the, 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 say, normal calcium channels or sodium channels. Okay, and needless to say, that's a difficult thing to do in vivo. So it's very hard to show that, that the, um, to, to do the gold standard experiment as it were in a, in a in vivo behaving context. So trying to encapsulate the properties of the parental neuron with this in mind, um, what we were finding was that the, uh, the, there's basically three kinds of spikes in a pyramidal neuron. There's the sodium spike, which is the one that's, that all models refer to. This is basically the output spike. And then there's a calcium spike, which I really haven't had a chance to talk about, but this is a really important um, a driving force that causes bursts in the neurons in the apical dendrite. And then there are zones where the dendrites are really thin, where you can get NMDA spikes. And essentially, we, we would... Um, put forward a model something like this. We're not quite sure how many compartments you should have, but there should be interaction between the, the two main initiation zones for sodium and calcium. And then lots of um, spots on the dendrite that, that could evoke NMDA spikes. And, and just as um, Jeff and Supertai were saying in, in their paper, uh, what you expect from this is that if there's lots of inputs as there are, there are these horizontally running fibers in, in layer one, they'll form they'll form basically um, probably randomly synapses onto different compartments of, of the apical dendrite, here the tough dendrite, and they become basically pattern detectors. That's what this combination lock is supposed to indicate. So basically some, this cell could know whether a particular eight uh, inputs came to the cell and, and it could have an enormous influence on, on the output of this neuron. Unlike the standard model, which doesn't care uh, which particular eight um, uh, synapses come, and usually eight would not be enough to do anything to the cell. Um, this is also a tremendous nonlinearity, so it's like a bomb going up within the within the in the cell, and it's basically able to catch these these patterns, and it's all dependent on clusters. So the the question becomes: Do we see these clusters in vivo? When we see NMDA spikes, and now really fast because I'll, I'll still, otherwise we're really running out of time. Um, the we, we have been able to show that there are NMDA spikes in vivo. I, I won't go into this paper, but you can uh, see that, that at least, um, I'll just put a flag in the ground that we think we've seen these in, in, in vivo. And there's other kinds of evidence for clustering in, in different papers. And here was a, uh, a study um, from Sishon and Gan, in which, uh, they, although the title says branch specific dendritic calcium spikes, um, if you read it through the paper, you find that they're NMDA uh, dependent. And, and actually, um, this is another problem. I think there's, there's such an aversion to saying 
NMDA spike that, that people find ways around it in the literature. And so you have to pay attention to see whether or not something actually probably has found an NMDA spike. I think this is in a way a tragedy because the, 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 the word calcium spike for me is a reserved word for a, a kind of spike that comes in the apical dendrite and spreads all the way into the tuft. Um, and calling an NMDA dependent um, spike, a, 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 an NMDA dependent calcium spike is a bit like calling, uh, if you would do two photon imaging of calcium at the cell body, looking for activity and finding that it's, that you're really using the calcium in that case to, to indicate that there are sodium spikes at the cell body. And it'd be a tragedy, I think, to say that they're TTX sensitive calcium spikes at the cell body. I mean, really they're, they're sodium spikes that, that engender some calcium that comes with them. I think it's really important that, that we, even if we don't agree on the word NMDA spike, that we agree on something uh, that d d designate this as a different phenomenon to a calcium spike. And, and that what we're trying to capture, I think, is the locality of this. So the space matters and the, the particular, it means that particular synaptic inputs could matter if it's an NMDA spike. Okay, and I'll, I'll just whiz through this. There's, there's actually now way more than I could have time to show in terms of evidence for clustering in vivo. I think it's, it's uh, among the cognoscenti, certainly at the, at the Gordon Dendrites conference, for instance, it's, it's, a, it's a done deal and everyone's convinced that uh, clustering occurs and, and therefore that NMDA spikes should occur and that this has effect on plasticity and learning. So that's the quick summary. And, and just really quickly also, because I promised, I think the other thing that's happened in the meantime that's really important um, in terms of learning in dendrites is, is this thing called BTSP. And um, this started with uh, Albert Lee and, and Michael Brecht, who were doing recordings. These were heroic recordings using um, patch clamps from a, a mounted fixation device onto the head um, that allowed them to do wholesale patch recordings in freely moving animals. And, and when uh, Albert went to Genelia Farm from Berlin, he started doing these amazing experiments where he put the animal in a track, well, these are quite conventional experiments, except that, that he was doing a wholesale recording from a CA1 neuron at the same time. But, but the animal was running around on a, on a conventional track, and you can see that um, as, as happened, the, they've discovered here, again, a place cell, meaning there's for CA1 cells tend to spike in a particular place. Um, and every now and again, or, or quite frequently actually, they would find a cell where uh, for the first few laps, it, it had no place. It, and that, that happens quite a lot. Um, so it has no particular place. But in this case, because they were the whole cell, they could actually depolarize the no neuron. And they could, they could make this neuron a, a place cell at, uh, um, at some, in this case, random place on the track. And, and the, the, um, uh, you have to stop for a moment to imagine just how amazing this is, because when you look at these traces, it looks like there's no input at all to the neuron. And, and yet suddenly there's a place here, and, and the only manipulation that's been done is postsynaptic. So one has to imagine that there is some input to this neuron, um, or, or else this is some sort of spooky action at a distance. But, but, the, but the point, I think the only reasonable explanation of this is that there's some dendritic input that's basically invisible at the cell body. And, and they're waking it up by depolarizing the cell. And the other amazing thing about this is that the cell goes completely wild when at this place. So that means that there's a, a tremendous non-linearity. This is much more than, than just a 30% change in a few synapses. This is making the cell go from, from completely silent to, to, to jumping out of the dish. So it, it's, well, in this case, it's in the brain, <laughs> but, but, uh, but um, it goes completely wild at this point. And, and that speaks, I think, to a, a, a huge dendritic nonlinearity occurring. Um, so at Genalia Farm, he clearly spoke to Jeff McGee, who refined this experiment. Jeff McGee, I think, is one of the finest uh, researchers I know of. And, and uh, I guess this came easily to him um, to think of how to adapt this experiment so you didn't have to do this kind of heroic approach. They, they then head fixed the animal on a treadmill they now had a, a track essentially, and they could repeat these experiments and 
sure enough, um, they've been able to get this experiment going regularly and they can even induce this now with, with, uh, with, uh, um, with plateaus. In this case, they're spontaneous. Or in this case, they're induced. Sometimes they're spontaneous. Other times they can induce the, the, uh, the plateau and, uh, and then the cell um, goes completely nuts at a particular place and they can even choose where that place is. So I think this is, this is the closest we come then to one shot learning and it's something really out of the park. It's not, it's not uh, your typical um, LTP experiment. Um, but it's, it's relatively new and there's relatively few people going with this. So they're the two things that I would put my finger on. Okay, really quickly now, um, the, the study that I promised. Uh, so this is the work from Guy and Jiwen. And it's really based on, we've been tilting at the problem of how do the, the, uh, the two main compartments of a pyramidal neuron interact. And, and what we think is that the, the, the bottom compartment or the basal compartment uh, processes inputs that are essentially external coming from your sensory apparatus, or if they're further up in the hierarchy of the cortex, then they're coming in a feed forward sense from lower cortical areas. Um, and that the top compartment is, is getting feedback predominantly and the feedback in, is, must be coming from your brain in some sense. So it's existing in your brain. And, and in that sense, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's all, it combines all of the experience you've previously had and is some sort of prediction or context. We don't know what the best word would be to use for, for this kind of input. And then the question is what happens when, when input comes to either to this box or to this box or both at the same time. And that's what we've been concentrating a lot on. But in the meantime, what, what I think um, became clear since I moved to Berlin, which was in 2012, is that this really is very close to memory in some sense, because it's existing, because it's, it's basically what your, what your brain is generating, it's got to have something to do with your previous experience. And therefore memory is somehow built into this. The other thing to say is that the, there's lots of feedback coming from lots of different areas, including higher order thalamus. Um, and I, I won't have a lot of time to dwell on that, but basically we can show it through, these are imaging now of, of transgenic animals or virally infected animals where we can where we can basically express fluorescent proteins in the axons of particular um, neurons in other areas of the brain. And then you can see them um, forming uh, a dense projections to layer one here of some of the sensory cortex. Now, for, um, what we looked at in this uh, study was the, the, last, uh, the last projection from the hippocampus, if you like, back to the neocortex. And, and so there's several structures between the hippocampus and the neocortex, basically the, the parahippocampal structures, um, which includes perirhinal, interrhinal, parahippocampus, and so on. And so we were interested in this last, uh, the, the last um, projection that, because presumably uh, the, the idea would be that, that if the, if the consolidation due to the, the activity of the hippocampus is, has to happen in the neocortex, then there's some information that's important that's coming along this, this last projection. Um, and, and here you can see us uh, some, some experiments in which we've we put YFP or, or a fluorescent protein in the perirhinal cortex. And you can look in the neocortex over here and see a density in layer one. And, and sure enough, so, so that was the first observation that, it, I shouldn't say the first in the sense that we were the first, that, that, that has been observed before anatomically. But for us, this was the first time we realized there was something really important about layer one relative to, to the hippocampus and its input. So we focused on this and we used a behavioral task, uh, which is really quite nifty and comes from the, um, the, the Brecht lab, which is almost next door in, uh, on the same campus as us in Berlin. And basically what you do is you stick a wire into or, a, or an electrode into, into the cortex and you use just a little bit of current and you train the animal to lick if it feels you stimulated its brain. And the advantage you have when you do this is one, you know where you stuck your electrode. So you don't have the, 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 the normal problem one has with memory that it's really distributed over the whole brain. At least we expect some changes to happen near our electrode. And, and secondly, the animals learn this extremely quickly. So in a, just, in a matter of 10 trials and they're off, and then they can do this um, really well. 
Um, we could show that it was hippocampal dependent and that if you blocked the, the perirhinal cortex, it, um, you could also block this, this uh, behavior. Okay, so moving right along, um, the first thing we did was to, to uh, record how animals learnt this task. And, and this is just kind of a learning curve where if they, if they correctly respond to the stimulus by licking for the reward, then, then it goes up. If they incorrectly lick, it goes down. So in this case, you can see that they learn after just a few trials and, and a control animal just continues to get it right for the rest of the session. Then we expressed what, what are known as dreads, which, uh, um, which are basically a, a protein which has a, a, for which the receptor binds a chemical that isn't normally in the brain. And, uh, and we can inject that chemical wherever we like. And, and um, it's called a dread, this, this approach. But basically, we, we basically get the um, perirhinal neurons to express these, these receptors. And that means their axons also are expressing the receptors. And we can put then the chemical that binds to these receptors in, in the neocortex. And that means we can suppress the axon. And that means we can do this whole experiment and just block the effect of the perirhinal cortex on the neocortex without affecting anything else, without affecting the action of the perirhinal cortex on other areas and so on and so forth. So we're just blocking the uh, perirhinal cortex. And a bonus is that we can put the drug in layer one of the cortex. So we can even ask what layer is important here, although that's not necessarily so important because the projection from the perirhinal cortex anyways goes predominantly to layer one. Well, lo and behold, when we put the chemical, which happens to be called CNO, into layer one of the cortex, here and block the perirhinal um, influence on, on the, the cortex. The damn animals can't learn this. It's, and in fact, it's, it's a little bit uh, more interesting than that. They're not like untrained animals that just always get it wrong. They're, they they kind of get it and then they stop getting it and they kind of get it and they stop getting it. It looks a little bit like anterograde amnesia. That's really hard to pin down. But still, they basically, they're not able to really get on top of this task. Just, and, and you've got to think about what this is. Just by putting this chemical in layer one of one column of, of the neocortex, we can, we can stop the behavior of the animals. It's just off the wall. Um, so that's what the, the uh, collected statistics look like. And, and last thing, which is I think just as important as all the rest of the things I've just said, is that if you train the animal first, and then you put in the, the, the then you block the perirhinal cortex to the neocortex then the animals do perfectly well. In fact, they're doing better because at this point they're, they're doing even better than normal control animals because they've been trained a lot. But, but basically the, the, you can't block their, their performance, which means that the perirhinal cortex is not affecting their perception of this. It's, it's only affecting their learning of this. Um, so we looked further, we, we did juxtacellular recordings. That means um, basically uh, extracellular, but touching um, recordings from the cell bodies of the perirhinal neuro, uh, neurons and we want to know what do they do during the task and basically when the animal recognizes you stimulating the brain these guys go crazy and they start burst firing if, it, if the animal doesn't recognize it then nothing happens um, and that's this is like several um, trials in a particular neuron you can see all the, the neurons going crazy and this is what this is basically the stats over many neurons so um, in, in hits, you get, you get a big change in the, in the firing of the neuron, and you get even bigger change in the burstiness of the firing. Um, I'm afraid we, I ran out of time to dwell on that, but, but burst, burst become a really important thing in the study. And then we did the same kind of recordings from the, from the somatosensory cortex. And, and here you do see often an increase in the firing. Um, the grade part here is now the the local microstimulation, so I've graded out so you don't see all the artifacts from the, from the microstimulation that's happening in this region of the brain. But basically, there's often an increase and, and we can block basically the modulation. One had to do this in the end with a, with a heat map because there were some neurons went down um, in, in their firing when we, when we stimulated the brain, some went up and you can see there's a range here. 65% um, of the cells go either up or down um, in, in of, the, of the cells we patched, and we patched always in layer five. And when we block the, the uh, perirhinal input to layer one, this modulation during learning, then, then less cells get modulated by this. So, um, so it's clear that the, the input to, to um, the neocortex is affecting its, the ability to change the firing of the, 
of the neurons, even though the firing is kicked off by stimulating S1 itself. So there's, a, there's a, an electrode in S1, which presumably is kicking off the firing, but if you don't get that re-entry input during learning from the perirhinal cortex, and you can't change the firing of the neuron. And the same thing with bursts. So there's, there's a certain fraction of these are modulated by, um, their bursts are modulated, I should say, or their burstiness is modulated, and not when you block the, the, uh, the, the perirhinal input. So going, I really have to rush here, sorry about this. So we did two photon imaging from the dendrites of, of, um, of the somatosensory cortex to see what's going on in the pyramidal neuron dendrite. Because as soon as you see burstiness, you should think, oh, maybe the dendrites are being hit. And, and sure enough, we can see these are responses in the dendrites at about this focal plane. That means around about where you would normally find calcium spikes. You can see in HIT trials, there's very often a, a response in the dendrites. And we can see that these different populations of dendrites coming out. There's, there's some that go crazy with lots of calcium, some that actually reducing calcium, and some that, that are not responsive. And these were the stats on that. So only a relatively small fraction of them go crazy. Um, and then a, a, an, another third of them, or slightly over a third of them, actually get suppressed. And then there's about half of them that are not responsive. So when we, when we recorded, ooh, I've got a funny, excuse me, I guess you don't see that. Okay. Um, so when we recorded from the cell bodies of the same neurons, well, the same depth neurons, in different experiments, we get exactly the same statistics for on cell, that's to say firing, increasing at the cell body, decreasing is the same kind of proportion and, um, and not responding. And the question was, is this really causal? And that's where really this, this subject gets really hard. How do, you, how do you show that? And we have a couple of ways to get at that, neither which I think are completely conclusive, but I think are telling. One is to put baclofen, which, well, I'll, I'll explain all the details, this ends up being a way to block calcium spikes really effectively. And this we've been able to show time and time again, and I'll, I'll prove it to you if, if you demand in the question time. But, but just take it from me at the moment, this blocks um, calcium in the dendrites. And here we can actually look at the behavior of the animal and get the same effect as blocking the perirhinal input if we block the dendrites of the of the um, pyramidal neurons. And the other thing that we could do is put channel rhodopsin in, den in dendrite targeting interneurons, which are, happen to be called somatostatin neurons. Um, they're just a, a type of, of inhibitory neuron that's known to target the apical dendrites. And again, in this case, we can really um, effectively block the learning of the animal if we just turn on the light and stimulate these neurons while the animal is doing the behavior. So summarizing all of that, um, we've, what we think we've got here is, is proof that the perirhinal cortex gates learning in layer one of the cortex and, and makes the pyramidal neurons go from low frequency regular um, firing to high frequency burst firing. Um, and, that's, and we think this because if you block the perirhinal input to layer one, they stop doing this. And, and on the other hand, if you block it when they've already learned, then they don't do this. So that, that for us speaks to the gate being in layer one. And, and so I would like now to be bold and claim that at least for this, this kind of learning that's hippocampal dependent, that layer one is, is, a, is a universal locus of, of cortical memory. It's a bit bold, I understand. I'm, I, I'm not claiming that you can't change any other synapses in the brain, but somehow there's, there's something really important about this. And and it's, it's worth noting that all of the different structures that we think of as related to memory, controlling memory, like the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, of course, the hippocampus that I've been talking about, um, project to layer one. The, the hippocampus seems to do it through the, the parahippocampal structures, and the cerebellum and the basal ganglia go to second order thalamic nuclei that themselves go to layer one. And so um, I, I offer now as a possibility that, that the error detection is in fact being done by these these other structures, or maybe we shouldn't just call it error detection, but, but uh, doing something special, let's say forming the criteria for which you should use for, for consolidating memory. And then all they do is signal layer one to say, now's the time to consolidate memory. So that's, that's if you like, a, uh, offering a, 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 a way of conceiving what these structures are doing and why the architecture of the brain is the way it is. And effectively what that would mean is that all that you can do with these kinds of memory is affect context or, or feedback. So you're only allowed to, to gate 
the effect of those and you don't want to get these feed forward connections because you want to leave the feature intact. So the feature should stay the same. It should just react to a new context. All right. So here I've finished and I want to say thank you to all of the people involved. So of the things I described directly, all the people in uh, red contributed, but uh, there's lots of going on in the lab that I didn't get time to talk about. Sorry for going over time. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Matthew. That was such a great review. Sorry about the short time. <laughs> uh, yeah, so thanks. You should go ahead, uh, Lucas. There are a couple of questions. Should we address them now or do you think uh, in the discussion? We should go straight to the discussion panel. Uh, okay. We're running out of time. So. Okay. Matthew, we have several questions that we'll get to in the discussion for you. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. Thanks a lot, Matthew. Uh, Elena, can you, are you ready? Can you share your screen? And, yes, uh, I can. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Uh, it's uh, Alana. Alana, I'm sorry. So, um, Thanks so for asking. I, yeah, I'll give a, a, a brief uh, bio for you. So Alana Jones is a neuroscience PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania. She works in uh, Cording and Lab with Conrad Cording. She was previ previously affiliated with John Hopkins, Stanford, and Dartmouth College. And her research focused on understanding the nonlinear computations in dendritic integration, while guided by the underlying principles of deep learning and AI. And we are really happy to have you here, uh, Alana, and excited to hear about what you have to show. Thank you. I'm excited too. Um, so again, uh, my name is Alana Jones. Uh, my advisor is Professor Conrad Corden. And today I'll be talking about uh, my project, which tries to ask the question, can single neurons solve MNIST? and looks into the computational power of biological dendritic trees. Um, so since neurons have been identified as singular distinct units that make up the brain, uh, the question of what can a neuron do has been a classic question in neuroscience. However, the uh, definition of do is a bit vague and I try to define it in two ways here. Uh, you can define it in terms of its role. So what do neurons do to mediate behaviors? Um, so say if you were to have a series of neurons that uh, once there is an input to one neuron, there's another neuron that receives that output and so on until there is a behavior uh, at the very end. Um, if you were to remove one neuron from that causal chain uh, and that behavior is no longer there, then you might say that that neuron is necessary for that behavior and may be uh, possible for it to mediate that behavior. So that's one way of thinking about neurons um, and what they do. And the way that I'll be focusing on this talk is to consider uh, what neurons can do in terms of computational capability. And to do so, I consider a neuron as an input-output device where inputs are received in the neuron's dendritic tree, integrated at the soma and uh, into the soma, and then uh, the soma producing a uh, voltage output, which can be reduced to simply the presence or absence of a of a uh, action potential spike. Um, but I'm not the first to approach uh, neurons as input output devices, as the audience should know. Uh, and after the wonderful talk by Professor Larkin, uh, but uh, in 1943, uh, one of the some of the earliest uh, computational neuroscientists, McCulloch and Pitts, um, they produced the, they formulated the, uh, one of the first neuron models, which is the McCulloch and Pitts neuron model, where uh, it can be simply uh, summarized as the uh, linear summation of inputs uh, and weighting those inputs and putting them through an output nonlinearity. This is the thresholding function to produce a binary output of one or negative one. And these neurons could be linked up together in a circuit to form uh, logic functions, very simple functions uh, that are quite low dimensional. Is fast forward 70 years later, and you can see here, we have uh, an example of an artificial neural network, which actually uses neurons very similar to the McCulloch and Pitts neuron. Uh, where they, each neuron within this very large uh, algorithm uh, has a linear weighted sum of its inputs and puts each of those inputs through a, uh, an activation function 
uh, not necessarily a thresholding function, but an activation function nonlinearity. Um, and these algorithms are able to do very high dimensional image classification where uh, the images uh, have very, uh, have many different pixels in each pixels dimension and uh, they're high resolution, hence they're high dimensional images. And they're able to classify those images by uh, determining what objects class uh, each image uh, belongs to. Um, and as has been said before, and this might be a, a dead horse we keep beating, but uh, uh, this, these neurons in both the McCulloch pitts neuron and artificial neural networks follow the point neuron assumption, uh, which assumes that the dendrites themselves are linear, um, hence the linear weighted sum, as I was talking about before. However, dendrites are nonlinear. Uh, it's uh, as found in this uh, review by London and Hauser. Uh, there can be uh, logical operations done in the dendrites, such as in not functions. Uh, there's a coincidence detection using backpropagating action potentials and uh, calcium spikes, as well as uh, attenuation uh, leading to low pass filtering as the voltage, uh, as the current flows through the dendritic tree and more. So, we can say possibly that point neuron models may be grossly underestimating what neurons could do. So how do we ask what neurons can do? Um, I will be turning to neuron modeling and I will talk about two general procedures for how neuron modeling is typically done. Well, the first procedure is how neuron model is typically done and traditionally done. Uh, and then I propose a, another procedure uh, that uh, my research is going to be based on with uh, differing benefits. So the first procedure I'll be talking about is empirical neuron modeling procedure, uh, where um, the, uh, a current input uh, is uh, typically put into a real neuron uh, in slice or uh, in vivo or in vitro. In vitro, i am got to check that. And, uh, the neuron is then recorded, uh, its output is recorded um, to, so that you have an empirical recording of its output. And now that you have the known input that you gave to the neuron and a recorded output, you can then use a neuron model to fit that out input output function. So that fitting process is typically called optimization or training or learning, uh, but uh, the point of this is that um, once you have the input current, can your neuron model produce an output that matches the empirical output? And this matching, uh, once that matching has been achieved, then you typically say that you have a good neuron model. And this is beneficial because then you can uh, test counterfactual conditions as well as uh, uh, make predictions about what the neuron that your mo neuron model is based off of may do under other conditions that you may not have uh, observed already. The second procedure that I talk about is, uh, is I'm going to propose is based mainly about around this question. Like with artificial neural networks from deep learning, can we test a neuron's ability to perform tasks. If we were to set up these two setups, uh, empirical, uh, the empirical recording based setup and the task based mo neuron modeling setup, uh, you can see that instead of a somatic current or a, a gen uh, an input current, you can have dendritic task inputs, which I'll be talking, uh, I'll clarify in a second. And instead of an empirical cord recording as your output, you have instead a correct classification. If it's not clear now, it should be clear that uh, the task that I'm talking about is a classification task. Um, uh, and uh, I'll define what that classification task is ex exactly uh, with my project in just a, in, in the next slide. But the reasons for uh, take using a task-based setup allows us to take a, a bit of a principled approach to setting what the dendritic inputs are. 
um, as opposed to doing random inputs or uh, you know uh, limiting ourselves to a, a low dimensional input, uh, we can actually look at uh, what neurons are capable of doing when it comes to uh, high dimensional um, uh, many dimensional uh, dendritic inputs um, using uh, these types of classification tasks. And we can also quantify neuron model performance via an accuracy measure, uh, quite like uh, how we test deep learning models. So what kind of task am I talking about? I'm talking about a binary classification task of images. And I do binary, I choose binary classification because going back to uh, how we were uh, defining how uh, the neurons input output function, the output of a neuron in so far as we're concerned is binary. There is either a presence or an absence of an action potential. Um, so uh, if we look here, uh, we have several different uh, Im uh, image data sets. Uh, I'll focus here on MNIST. So MNIST is a data set of handwritten numbers uh, from numbers zero through nine. And uh, they are, there are 10 classes in this data set. However, right here I have listed only two classes and that's what I'll be using for my binary classification. I choose these classes based off of their linear separability. I use a linear classifier, a linear discriminant analysis to determine which two, which pair of classes were the least linearly, linearly discriminatable. And, uh, and I found that three and five were the most confused uh, between the two. Um, and lastly, uh, these uh, MNIST, Fashion MNIST, EMNIST, and Kuzu CG MNIST, uh, I have padded from their 28 by 28, uh, uh, 28 by 28, dimensions to 32 by 32 to make them uh, 10, 24 uh, dimensional. And I also use CIFAR 10 and Street View House numbers, uh, which are larger in size, and USPS, which is much smaller. So I've defined my, what my input is, which is these images, uh, high dimensional images. And I also defined what my output is, which is uh, these binary, the binary classification of these classes, so three and five would correspond to zero and one. And so now, what do I, what will I choose for my neuron model in this task-based neuron modeling setup? So uh, this is a novel part of my project, uh, which is uh, the one tree, or dendritic neuron model. And uh, what makes this, uh, what makes this model useful is that it is a deep neural network with dendritic sparsity constraints. I use a very abstracted model that is able to do a task such as a deep neural network with all of its, uh, with all of its compart uh, pieces that allow it to learn tasks. And then I impose upon it a biological property that it belongs to neurons, which is dendritic sparsity. And I do this in order to learn what the impact of dendritic sparsity is on a learning system. So here I have a cartoon of a neuron and one of its subtrees is receiving uh, inputs one, two, three, four uh, to, uh, to reflect this neuron. And it, it, it's very unlike a, a pyramidal cell, it's probably more like a uh, cerebellar stellate cell, but um, to uh, mimic this uh, structure, uh, I have a binary tree uh, neural network that is uh, very sparse, and it is comprised of nonlinear nodes representing compartments of a dendritic tree, where each branch or compartment of the tree only receives two inputs. And this is reflected in the uh, neural network version or the one tree version of the uh, dendrite. And lastly, the one exception null node in this structure is the soma node or the output node. And this node only receives one input and that 
uh, has a sigmoidal nonlinearity allowing its output to only be zero or one or trained to only be zero and one. So uh, what I do is that I'm trying to, given I have a task-based neuron modeling setup, I'm trying to understand, um, I'm trying to understand um, well, it's how the dendritic sparsity constraint has an impact on performance or accuracy in this task. And what I'll be doing is I'll be comparing it to a linear point neuron model, or rather uh, what I'll be doing using really is a, uh, a proxy to this point neuron model, which is a linear classifier, linear discriminant analysis, and uh, also comparing it to a two layer fully connected neural network. We expect that the one tree will perform better than the uh, linear classifier, mainly because of the nonlinear uh, nonlinearities that uh, belong to the one tree. And we expect that uh, the fully connected neural network, uh, this two layer FCNN, uh, which is a generally universal approximator uh, function to be able to perform uh, if not the same or better than the one tree. So this is a quite a busy slide, but I want to direct you to A. So A, the x-axis has a one tree, LDA, which is linear discriminant analysis, which is our linear classifier, and the FCNN, or the fully connected neural network. And what you see in the y-axis is accuracy. So what you can see is that in the MNIST task, uh, the one tree performs better than a linear classifier, but worse than the fully connected neural network. And we see this in FMNIST, EM, Fashion MNIST, EMNIST, Kuzu CG MNIST, um, where that replicates this result. And um, uh, if we look at uh, these three other tasks, um, it's interesting to see that CFAR10 and SVHN, the uh, very large, very, uh, the 3072 dimensional uh, uh, inputs as compared to these other four, which are 1024, um, they perform, the one tree performs about the same as the fully connected neural network. But if you notice here, their accuracies are actually quite close to 50%, which is chance. And our threshold for uh, removing trials that did not train well uh, may not have removed every trial that did not train well, thus creating a higher variability in uh, these results. So I wouldn't actually trust these, um, but it, because it's so very difficult to interpret, uh, we cannot necessarily say that the one tree is performing at the level of the fully connected neural network And at this time. And then uh, the USPS uh, data set, the one tree performs worse uh, than the linear classifier in the FCNN, and this may also be due to the same uh, uh, training thresholding problem where uh, uh, trials that fit where the model failed to train may have been included. So the takeaway from this slide is that uh, the one tree actually performs worse than the uh, the one tree performs worse than the fully connected network, but better than the linear classifier. This follows our expectations, and this actually um, makes me think that perhaps if we are going to, um, you know, consider uh, deep neural networks as some way of viewing into what neurons are capable of, it's important to also consider biological properties um, that, uh, that neurons actually have. Um, because that can impact the performance of the deep neural networks we're using to approximate real neurons. Um, and so we've learned this. We want to ask what else can impact single neuron computation? And unfortunately, I can't see the chat right now. Um, how am I on time? I just want to ask the moderators. Um, I think you have... 10 minutes left. Great, thank you. So what else could impact single neuron computation? We know that neurons have thousands of synapses. And what we also know is that uh, 
presynaptic axons can synapse up to approximately four times per postsynaptic neuron. So that means that there's at, uh, about four repeated inputs to the same neuron. Um, and we also know that in vitro multisynaptic batons, um, where uh, uh, presynaptic axons synapse multiple times onto the same postsynaptic neuron, uh, when these uh, presynaptic batons onto the same dendrite, uh, increases approximately sixfold after LTP induction, which implies, I think, that learning may impact replication of synapses. And uh, we would think that learning is involved with neuron computation or neuron computation is involved with learning. So the general hypothesis that I come away with this is that perhaps repeated synapses may also impact single neuron computation. How do we test this? Well, we, we can modify the one tree apparatus uh, that I suggested before uh, to take repeated synapses. So if we look to the left here, uh, here's the cartoon of the neuron again with multiple subtrees and each subtree re is receiving the same exact input one, two, three, four across all subtrees. And, um, and uh, when we translate that to the uh, deep learning model uh, that uh, of a uh, that has dendritic uh, dendritic tree constraints, uh, we get a K tree neuron model where each subtree in this cartoon neuron is represented as another as a as an added one tree, making a K tree um, for our model. So where K is equal to the number of subtrees in the model. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is that the SOMA, which had only received one input uh, in the one tree, receives now K inputs uh, in the K tree. So in order to continue doing this uh, method where we're comparing the uh, K tree or the uh, dendritic sparsity constraint to a fully connected network, uh, we did, uh, want to make sure that we're uh, we also want to consider that the k-tree, when we add subtrees, increases the number of parameters. And there's a general rule of thumb in deep learning that the more parameters you have, the better the uh, performance of your deep learning network, kind of. So um, we wanted to control for this. So what we did was we modified the fully connected network to match uh, the k-tree parameter size. So these expressions here, um, determine are, are equal to the number of uh, parameters that each of these models have. So the k-tree where uh, n is equal to the size of the input um, and k is equal to the number of subtrees uh, result in 2k times the quantity of n minus 1 parameters and the fully connected neural network where it receives n inputs and has a hidden layer size h has h times the quantity of n plus 1 parameters. And when you set h to be equal to twice the number of subtrees, or, or 2k, uh, then these do not quite e equal each other, or but approximately equal uh, to each other. Um, uh, convince yourself of that. So uh, this is another busy slide, but I'll direct you to a again. Um, so uh, what we have on the x-axis is the uh, architecture, or k where k is equal to 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32. And then here we have the linear classifier uh, as a point of reference. And as we increase k, uh, we can see the impact it on this resultant per performance on the k tree and the in black and the uh, F fully connected neural network in gray. And you can see uh, the first thing that I want to point our, your attention to is that the K-tree's performance expectedly does go up as you increase the number of repeats. And this can be seen um, almost consistently across each of these tasks. What I want to also point out to you is that uh, it, the increase in K-tree performance begins to approach the performance of the increase in the fully connected neural network. And in some cases, matches, at least in the 32 case 
uh, across the fashion MNIST, eMNIST, and USPS uh, uh, data sets um, the performance of the fully connected neural network. And um, I say match in that they are, uh, when you use a t-test, they are not significantly different from each other. So they are not distinguishable um, from each other. So um, in some cases, this is not the case. So for KMNIS and SVHN, and in one surprising case in CIFAR-10, uh, the performance of the cage actually exceeds that of the fully connected neural network, though the fully connected neural network uh, seems to decrease in performance as you increase the hidden layer size. So the takeaway from this, the two takeaways from this is that synaptic repeats can improve K tree performance and uh, the, uh, and this performance can also match that of the fully connected neural network uh, that is comparable in size. So some discussion and takeaways, I want to address some assumptions and limitations. So uh, one general limitation to this is that, uh, uh, I, I'll just make a blanket statement. This is uh, not a, a realistic, I'm not starting from a point of realism, biological realism, I'm starting from a point of abstraction and moving toward biological realism. So uh, one, a 1D vectorized image classification task puts our neuron model out of green context, and that is fine. Uh, perhaps if we were to take a, find a uh, task that is uh, more biologically plausible, that would improve upon this work. Our model is a tenuous approximation to a real neuron. Um, uh, real neurons are feed forward. Uh, in real neurons, synapse location is not limited to uh, terminals of the dendritic tree. And uh, our neuron model is receiving real valued inputs, uh, not binary inputs. And that makes uh, more sense given that we're uh, in a feed forward regime. So knowing all of these things that allows us to narrow down to what our actual takeaways are, which is that dendritic tree structure constraints does actually impact neuron, uh, neuron computation in such a way that it actually can uh, decrease it from that of a fully connected network uh, point of comparison. And uh, with repeated inputs to, uh, this, uh, to this neuron model, we're able to improve uh, performance uh, and uh, computational performance of our model uh, to the point where it matches. Uh, that of a fully connected neural network in various data sets. So some relevance to deep learning. This is a special case of sparse neural network, the, the K-tree. The sparse network can perform at the level of the dense network using nearly the same amount of free parameters. And future work is to compare the K-tree sparse network to other types of sparse networks, such as randomly connected sparse networks or uh, pruned sparse networks uh, harkening back to the lottery ticket hypothesis, the one used in the lottery ticket hypothesis paper. And uh, lastly, uh, the relevance to neuro neuroscience, we're bringing a new approach where we're considering bringing deep learning approaches toward neuron modeling, where we judge neuron model performance instead of traditionally trying to match neuron physiology data. And our results suggest that repeated inputs to the dendritic tree could perform, improve its ability to perform complex computations. So it may be an uh, important takeaway for modelers to also consider uh, the possibility of repeated inputs. Some future work we'd like to do is uh, to introduce more biological constraints to our abstracted model, as well as jumping to more, taking a leap into uh, biological realism by training biophysical neuron models to do image classification, kind of like a, a paper that came out of the uh, SIGEV lab uh, this year or last year. Um, so with that, I thank the Cording Lab, uh, they're very supportive, uh, my advisor Conrad Cording, uh, the Neuroscience Graduate Group, and the University of Pennsylvania. With that, are there any questions? Thanks a lot, and then, uh, congratulations on the great work. There are actually several questions uh, yeah. which I'd like to address then in, in the panel, but if you can also go through the Q&A and see if you 
you want to answer some of the, some of them there. I have a quick question. Is this work available in a GitHub repository? Um, so I'm currently working on making sure that the code is uh, good. I have a private repository now, uh, and uh, I'm trying to make sure that it is deliverable so that people can possibly use this. Okay. So congratulations and, again, and uh, thank you for, for being here. Thank you. So uh, we move on to uh, Blake. Blake, are you around? Yep, I'm here. All right. So with a quick bio. So Blake Richards, Professor Blake Richards, graduated from the uh, University of Toronto and University of Oxford. And he's the principal investigator at Link Lab and a professor at the uh, University of Toronto. He explores the neurobiology of learning and memory, the ultimate goal of understanding how experience alters synaptic connections in the brain. And Blake is a very well-known researcher, both in neuroscience and the machine learning world. And uh, I myself had the pleasure of watching him speak at several occasions in, in conference. And we are really happy to be here. So this is yours. Thank you very much, Lucas. Um, I'm very happy to join you here today. It was uh, wonderful to see Matthew and uh, Alana's talks. Um, really fascinating stuff. Now, what I've planned for today is to actually try to inject a little bit of controversy into the love-in by uh, suggesting that the direction in which we can get help from dendrites is not necessarily from neuroscience to, to AI. It's actually ultimately kind of the other direction from AI to neuroscience. And that's where dendrites are important. But I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit. And I, I don't completely believe it. I'll, I'll try to make this more clear for you in my talk. So here I'm going to go and get this started. Share my screen. OK, I assume you can all see that. So uh, as I said, the question I'm going to ask is, what do dendrites have to do with machine learning? Now. Um, Let's just right off the bat say something that I think at this point in time is uh, broaching on non-controversial uh, within the neuroscience community. Dendrites are clearly important for the brain. I mean, just based on basic biophysical principles, we know that dendrites will determine what the computational capabilities of an individual neuron are. And furthermore, from the time of Ramoni Cajal, uh, whose illustration we see here, um, we've known that different neurons in different parts of the brain have very different dendritic structures, and this surely relates to the different computational roles of these different neurons. So as a neuroscientist, um, you know, one would be crazy to ignore dendrites, even though that was what we did for many decades, as Matthew pointed out, until we developed the experimental tools necessary to really work with them. But um, you know, for the sake of this talk, uh, we're not necessarily interested in just understanding the brain. We're interested in whether or not dendrites can help us to build brain-inspired AI. Um, now, in order to answer that question, I think it's important to differentiate between the question of algorithm and implementation. And this harkens back to Mars levels, but I'm not going to go over Mars levels too much. I will just clarify here that there are ultimately two ways in which brains can inspire artificial intelligence. So the first and the one that really arguably has um, had the most traction so far to date is actually algorithm development. Um, we can build artificial intelligence that uses brain-like recipes in order to process information and do calculations. And that's effectively what artificial neural networks are. They are an algorithm level model of how the brain works because they capture the key steps involved in neural calculation, namely parallel distributed processing across a large number of simple units. Um, but the other way, of course, that we can have brains inspire AI is actually at the implementation level. So how do you actually build a physical structure that implements uh, some algorithm or instantiates some calculations? And this, is, of course, um, you know, has to do with neuromorphic chip development, which a lot of people are interested in, but which to date hasn't actually sort of taken off um, outside of academic circles. Uh, and I think that it's, you know, I, I would propose, and as I said, I'm not 100% sure I fully agree with myself here, but I think I do for the most part that dendrites have the, actually the most potential for helping AI with respect to number two, 
chip, chip development and not necessarily with regards to the question of algorithmic development. And, and the reason I'd say that is because I think that ultimately dendrites are solving implementation problems for the brain. They, they are not key to the algorithmic properties of the brain. They are the way in which the brain successfully implements um, algorithms that could theoretically be implemented in other ways. So let's actually talk about what dendrites really achieve for the brain. And now Matthew and Ilana have already done a great job of highlighting some of the um, interesting things that dendrites can do. But I'll kind of give a, a pat glib answer here for a moment. And, and that is that there are two principal things that dendrites solve for the brain. The first is that they solve just the packing issue, right? I mean, we're, we all tend to think of those um, funny computer rendered images of neurons floating in space, with little electrical signals passing between them and stuff. But of course the real brain is a crowded place. And if you're actually gonna pack thousands of synapses onto a neuron, you need space to do it. So right off the bat, dendrites are a way to provide more physical sites to be synapsed onto and to allow for greater connectivity. Here you're looking at an image from a rainbow mouse. Now this is a particularly dense area to help me make my point, but um, this is the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. And these are all, so this, is a, this is a mouse that's been genetically engineered to express slightly different mixtures of fluorescent protein in each of the neurons in its brain. And in this way, you can see each of the neurons individually. And what you're looking at here are the cell bodies in the dentate gyrus and all of their dendrites uh, up in the top here. And you can imagine with such a crowded field, if you tried to pack 10,000 synapses onto one of these cell bodies, it would be, it'd be impossible. So you need a larger surface area with which you can actually just put synapses on. Now, the other more interesting thing that dendrites solve, though, I would argue, and this gets to uh, Matthew and Alana's talks, is the question of segregating and staging computation. So um, it's ultimately important at the algorithmic level to stage certain calculations so that they're done in isolation from each other up until a certain point and then combined, and also to apply the right nonlinearities at the right moment. And dendrites help us to achieve this. So if we take the model that Matthew described, where we have here um, a pyramidal neuron, like a real pyramidal neuron illustrated on the left, um, its dendrites have these interesting nonlinear properties, either driven by sodium channels or NMDA, cha sorry, by NMDA channels, sodium channels are for the axon, by NMDA channels or by calcium channels. And um, we can view these nonlinear channels in these dendrites as, a, as giving us this sort of layered nonlinear computation. So we have a series of nonlinear computations that can act together in isolation from the other computations that are occurring. And this gets at the point of space, the fact that the, when dendrite, when synapses are located close to each other on, in, on a dendritic uh, branch, they are necessarily going to be involved in an initial calculation together. So we have these, these different branches that group different computations and which can allow for a series of nonlinearities via NMDA channels. And then these will be combined and integrated by either the cell body where sodium nonlinearities will determine spiking activity or at the apical trunk where calcium nonlinearities will determine uh, bursting potentially. And that's all very important surely for how the neurons compute. And it provides an elegant and ener energy efficient means of segregating computations and staging nonlinearities at the right point in time in the computation. Um, now, I wanna give you today an example of how I think this is really important. So from a neuroscience perspective, I, I just wanna reiterate that this is like absolutely key. And an example of how this is key is the question of how we can combine error signals with other information, whether it be sensory or motor or whatever. Um, so if we think about a uh, neural network that's trying to learn something, and it's got, say, some activity X driven by some input to the system, some external input to the system. And there is some learning that is going on that's trying to minimize a particular error. It can be whatever you want. Maybe you're trying to get the target on darts, or you're trying to keep your bike upright, or sound like you actually can speak a language. Um, then the, uh, the key issue that you face is that your error signal 
uh, which say will tell you something about the ways in which you're failing to, to give the correct output. Um, you want that error signal to be combined with your other information in an appropriate manner. You don't want to just add them together linearly. If you do that, if you just add your signal X with your error E, then you're going to get uh, a confused computation, as it were, where now the neuron starts treating the error signal as if it was part of the sensory representation. Now, there are some ways to maybe make that work, and people have proposed various formulations for this, um, but it's actually, it, it renders the, the entire learning process a lot more difficult. So ideally, what you want to do is you want to keep your error signal separate until the, the, the point, the stage in your algorithm at which you actually want to combine it with the other information in order to do your learning. Now, one potential way you could do that is just by separating the signals in time. So you could have uh, your signal X occur and then your error occur later. But the difficulty that you still face if you do this temporal segregation of the signals is that you are still going to not be able to, dif it's still gonna be difficult to differentiate the two signals at the biophysical level. So if I am say some molecule that is paying attention to the spiking activity of the cell and I'm using that activity to inform my learning, and I need to treat the, say, sensory inputs as a different form of information from the error inputs when I'm determining my synaptic updates. If both the sensory inputs and the error inputs just generate a spike, then I, as a molecular integrator, can't differentiate these two things, and I'm just going to treat them like the same signal. And that's potentially problematic as well. Dendrites solve these problems for us by um, allowing us to receive things like an error signal at an alternate location on the neuron that is segregated and so that the computations that are going to happen with the error can potentially happen in isolation before they get combined with the, the sensory information. Moreover, the nonlinearities that exist in the dendrite will allow us to actually have the cell spike in different ways, to have different activity waveforms that are indicative of dendritic activity and their by potentially error signals. So um, Matthew mentioned this, you can have a situation, for example, where a basic bottom-up input to a neuron will generate a single spike, but then when you combine that with some top-down input, you get a complex spike or a burst or something like that, and that can have a different signal for your plasticity mechanisms. Indeed, we see this happen in the, the, the classic example of this is in the cerebellum. So cerebellar Purkinje cells, um, have these beautiful dendritic trees. We've all seen them many times before. Um, and these dendritic trees receive inputs from the parallel fibers that carry, a, carry various motor information uh, and, and potentially sensory information as well. And then there's this interesting projection called the climbing fiber, which um, actually wraps around Purkinje cell dendrites in a one-to-one -one fashion. So one climbing fiber to one Purkinje cell. And when you activate the parallel fibers, you'll just get a standard spike from these Purkinje cells. But if you activate them together with the climbing fibers, you get this comp what they call a complex spike out of the Purkinje cells. And what's been shown experimentally is that if you run a synaptic plasticity experiment, um, then uh, if you just stimulate the parallel fibers, you will get an increase in the synaptic weights uh, from those parallel fibers up to some ceiling. Uh, but if you stimulate them together with the complex fibers, you then decrease those weights and you get LTD. And this complex fiber activation and the complex spike, sorry, the climbing fiber activation and the complex spike that it initiates is critical for this. In the absence of this, you, you don't get this. And so in other words, the neuron is using the nonlinear activation that the complex spike induces, sorry, that the climbing fibers induce in the dendrites it's using that nonlinear activation to differentiate the error signal from the climbing fibers and the inputs from the parallel fibers. And we've proposed uh, that this is something that's happening in pyramidal neurons and the neocortex as well. So um, I don't have to go over this too much because Matthew discussed it, but basically we have in pyramidal neurons uh, these you know, two different sort of dendritic areas, the, the basal tree, and the uh, distal apical tree. I'm going to ignore the uh, oblique dendrites here for a moment. And between these two uh, sets of dendritic branches, 
which are receiving the feed forward and feedback inputs uh, respectively to, to some degree, it's biology, so it's always messy. We have this active calcium zone, which can induce nonlinear activations. So if you just uh, activate the feed forward tree, typically you're gonna get a single spike out of the neuron. Whereas if you activate it conjunctively with feedback, as Matthew shown, has shown really elegantly, um, then you get this uh, plateau potential or calcium spike that introduces, induces a burst in the neurons. And um, one of the things that, uh, you know, we, I personally think is, is probably going on in, in cortex is indeed that the feedback signal that generates these plateau potentials is, is used in part for learning and to actually guide the synaptic plasticity in the feed forward synapses. So if you run uh, an LT, uh, uh, sorry, a synaptic plasticity experiment with just the feed forward synapses, it's a lot easier actually to induce LTD at these synapses. Um, and in order to get LTP, one of the ways in which you can do that is by adding in some feedback to get a burst. Uh, now this has been shown uh, to some degree. I mean, Matthew described some of the interesting experiments that way with behavioral uh, timescale plasticity showing that you can induce this, uh, this effect there. Um, but we have recently proposed a kind of mathematical version of this. Um, so based on a number of experimental findings, um, including the more recent ones, but also looking further back into the past and, and also based on Matthew's work, um, we proposed in a recent paper that I, I list here and I'm, I'm happy to provide, uh, I'll, I'll share the slides so you can find the link. Um, we propose the following learning rule, which we call burst dependent synaptic plasticity. And uh, the idea is effectively that we have, uh, this is the weight change between neurons I and J, this is the learning rate, this is gonna be the only equation I run through here. Uh, but just to get you to understand the rule, the, the basic idea is that if you have presynaptic inputs, then if the postsynaptic cell fires a single spike, you are going to get a LTD uh, occurring. Whereas if the postsynaptic cell fires a burst, you are going to get LTP occurring. So this learning rule is what expresses that because basically here we have the postsynaptic burst, which is a one or a zero. Um, and this is, this is uh, we subtract from this the running average of burst probability. So what happens is, is if the neuron bursts, this term becomes positive and you get LTP. If it doesn't burst, then this entire term is negative because B is zero and so you get LTD. And then otherwise we have here um, just something indicating that something's occurred postsynaptically and a presynaptic eligibility trace. And you can capture a lot of uh, experimental findings with this learning rule. I won't go through all of them, but indeed it, it uh, probably does relate to that uh, behavioral timescale plasticity stuff, as, as well as some of the other uh, phenomena shown in these papers. And what's interesting though, is that um, because the, of the nonlinear properties in the apical dendrites, which induce this burst firing, um, effectively you get end-to-end -end learning for free from this burst dependent plasticity rule, just by virtue of the way that apical dendrites integrate information and induce these nonlinearities in cells. So for example, if we take, this is a biophysical simulation here. So we're actually simulating um, neurons uh, using voltages and spikes and all that kind of stuff. Um, these are uh, reduced compartmental models that were actually fit to uh, data that Matthew Larkham kindly provided to uh, my collaborator on this project, Richard No. I believe Matthew, if, correct me if I'm wrong later, but I think it was your data that he fit to this, these, these neurons too. And if you wire up a group of simulated pyramidal neurons in, in this architecture, for example, uh, and you inject pulses of input to, pulses of current into the somata of the lowest layer of neurons, and then a teaching signal into the apical dendrites of the highest level neurons. So this here is showing the low level input. So what we're doing is we're training the system to do XOR. So we provide either this group of neurons with a pulse of current or this group of neurons with a pulse of current or both. So we get zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, one. 
And if we, we do this whole setup and then we provide a teaching signal to the apical dendrites of these guys that it just says like, basically, okay, we want you to activate, we're gonna give you a strong input when you should be giving an output here of one in, order, in response to one zero or zero one, or we're gonna give you a low output in response to zero zero or one one. Uh, over time, in a totally continuous manner, the network will learn to do XOR for you. And this just falls out uh, for free from the way that the burst depending First dependent synaptic plasticity rule interacts with the non-linearities in the dendrite. So here you see the output of the network before training and after training. And the only thing we've done to train this up is provide this teaching signal, which is current injected into the upper level apical dendrite. And the reason that works is because of the way the dendrites all communicate with one another. So if they project back to the apical dendrites of these neurons, what you end up getting is that this teaching signal gets reflected in the activity of the, these, these neurons. And so here BP refers to burst probability. So the probability of these guys bursting now becomes dependent upon the teaching signal that this neuron, these neurons are receiving. And in this way, the entire system actually communicates gradients back through the network in order to learn the task. And that's what allows the system to learn to treat input one and input two separately. So even though input one and input two are ultimately seeing the same data, they end up diverging in terms of how they respond. And this is critical because standard Hebbian mechanisms, for example, will always treat the same inputs the same way. And it doesn't, there is no teaching signal involved, so you can't differentiate these different cases. But with the nonlinearities that the apical dendrites induce, you now get a teaching signal for free. And you can actually train these, these things up to do a variety of things. Indeed, um, when we do an ensemble level model, which requires some additional math because we don't have the compute capabilities to simulate uh, millions of biophysical neurons doing this task. If you take an ensemble level model that is just the mathematical uh, uh, equivalent to the learning rule, but taken out to uh, a large ensemble of neurons, um, you end up deriving uh, gradient descent. And so we've shown, for example, that if we hook up a, a big ensemble model um, in a hierarchy and we use this burst dependent synaptic plasticity rule, um, then our uh, learning rule, which is in rand here, where we're also learning some feedback weights with it, uh, will perform just as well as backprop on CIFAR 10, for example. We contrast that with, for example, node perturbation, which is a classical uh, approach that instead just looks at uh, basically correlations and activity with an external reward signal um, and it sucks. Uh, and it also does better than, than feedback alignment, which is something a friend of mine, uh, Tim Lillicrap, had uh, hit upon a few years ago, um, which is where you just use fixed feedback weights and you just do backprop and, and still it, it's, it's not great for this. Um, similar story with ImageNet. So you can train up these networks, uh, just checking my time here, on ImageNet. Um, now, the burst dependent learning rule still doesn't perform quite as well as backprop on ImageNet because ImageNet is actually really tough. Um, but this is probably just a matter of tweaking and it takes a lot of hyperparameter optimization to really crunch down on ImageNet. But still, it can at least learn it in contrast to other learning rules. So, so our burst dependent learning rule with learned feedback weights is here in red and then feedback alignment is there. And, you know, something like heavy plasticity doesn't, doesn't even do this. Um, so my point is ultimately that the properties of apical dendrites provide a means for combining error signals with other signals appropriately. And this actually could allow neurons to follow loss gradients. Um, and in doing so, this solves a potentially tricky implementation problem for the brain. How do you differentiate your error signals from your sensory signals in a way that allows you to actually learn appropriately from the error signals. So if we're interested in building brain inspired chips, then theoretically we could use artificial dendrites to solve some of the same problems. And I think that's an interesting question that deserves investigation in the future. The other question though is what about algorithms? So what about if we just simulated dendrites if, so, so rather than actually trying to build like physical dendrites on a chip, we just simulated dendrites for the sake of achieving the same algorithmic uh, capabilities that neurons have. 
in order to get us closer towards AI that's more human-like or animal-like even. You know, theoretically, this isn't a crazy proposal. We know from the no free lunch theorems uh, from Wolpert and McReady that you cannot have a general purpose learning algorithm. There is literally no such thing that exists. Uh, if you look at the performance of any learning algorithm, a general purpose learning algorithm that is kind of good at any task will also kind of suck at every task simultaneously. And the only way you can get really good performance is by having algorithms that are specialized towards particular type of learning tasks. So when we think about the group of learning tasks that we might wanna learn in AI, um, arguably a lot of what we wanna do with AI intersects a fair bit with the sorts of things that humans are particularly good at, and even macaques and mice and Drosophila to some extent in any animal. So theoretically we could use uh, you know, the, the dendrites simulation of dendrites in order to constrain the algorithms that we're building uh, to build uh, AI that has inductive biases that help it do better at the sorts of tasks that animals and uh, well, animals are good at. The only thing that I'm unsure of for this though is that I'm not sure that necessarily we're going to find that the that actually simulating dendrites is the right way to implement these algorithms. So I would argue that what we can use dendrites for is to understand the algorithms that are occurring in the brain. And so, for example, if you look at Matthew or Alana's work or anyone who's studying, doing these really fascinating studies of dendrites, that's helping us to understand the computations that are occurring in the brain and potentially the algorithmic constraints that exist. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you actually have to simulate dendrites in order to achieve those algorithms. Once you've identified the algorithm and once you understand the algorithm that the brain is using, you can implement it however you want. Um, the analogy that I would use is, is with flight. And, and I use this also to correct a poor form of the analogy that sometimes gets shared around. Uh, so if we think about uh, the sort of Mars three levels and flight, at the computational level, you want to achieve this behavior, flight. The algorithm that helps you to achieve this computation is to create a pressure differential across the object in order to induce lift. And this algorithm is, this is, this is the uh, right algorithmic level for flight because an algorithm of course is a recipe that in the absence of any insight gives you the computation. In the absence of any insight, if you induce a pressure differential to induce lift, uh, a pressure differential across an object and induce lift, you're gonna get flight. Now, there are different ways though that you can achieve this algorithm. One of those ways is to flap wings. And, and indeed, the earliest design of airplanes, the people who were building those, they were inspired by birds and they help, birds help them to understand the need for creating lift and how to do that. But then once they understood the algorithm that birds were using, they didn't have to use flapping wings. They, they could use other means of achieving this algorithm. And indeed, jets ended up providing a much better way of, of achieving lift. So I would argue that it might end up being something similar with dendrites. The dendrites will help us to understand what algorithms the brain is using to engage in certain computations. And that'll be incredibly useful for AI potentially, because it, if we understand the algorithms that are occurring in the brain, we can then try to build things that do those algorithms. But does that mean we want to simulate dendrites for the AI? I would argue probably not. There will probably end up being better ways given our particular technology setups to achieve the same algorithms that dendrites can achieve um, for these artificial systems that we have. Um, so to kind of sum up, if you're a neuroscientist, I think you're crazy to ignore dendrites. I'm sure also that they will help us to understand the algorithms of the brain and that will help us to build better AI but I'm not convinced in the absence of actually trying to do neuromorphic chips that we'd ever really need to simulate dendrites in order to achieve really useful AI. I just wanna say thank you to the guys who helped me, uh, well, who did this work with me, uh, Jordan Gergiev, my student, Alexander Payer, and Richard No at uh, University of Ottawa and Friedemann Zenke uh, in Basel. And uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to now engage in the discussion about this point. <laughs> Thanks, Blake. Thanks that a was lot, great. Blake. That was uh, yeah. great as always. Uh, so, so Ty, you wanna go ahead with our panel? Yeah. So we have a bunch of questions, and I see uh, Alana has already answered a bunch. And uh, thank you for doing that. And uh, and Blake had answered a 
a bunch before. Um, there are some, some really specific questions and some sort of higher level questions as well. I guess one thread that was kind of running through some of the discussion is, um, you know, Matthew and, uh, and like you talked about kind of learning through apical feedback and apical dead rights. Um, but there are, you know, there are other learning mechanisms that are also present uh, in pyramidal neurons that don't necessarily incorporate uh, apical feedback. And, you know, how do you think about that? And is that, are those critical? Are they, uh, do they exist? <laughs> you know, how, how would you think about incorporating, you know, the, the other types of uh, forms of plasticity in the model? And, and Matthew, I don't know if you have a perspective on that. I mean, like, um, spike time independent plasticity, uh, heavy plasticity and so on. Yeah, exactly. Or, you know, uh, some stuff I've seen is like an NNDA spike, a basal NNDA spike, followed by a back action potential can cause a very localized form of plasticity, uh, independent of, you know, calcium spikes, those kind of things. And how do those kind of fit into your overall model of, of learning? So, so right at the moment, we, we haven't, we're, we're agnostic about what's going on in the, in the particular experiments I was showing. Um, and in principle, it could be any of those things. Um, I think if, if something like BTSP is at play, uh, then, then we're looking at something quite different. Although um, they, they do claim that there is a, a plasticity change in their experiments. In fact, it's built into the, the name, the pl synaptic plasticity is actually in, you know, the, the S doesn't come in the acronym, but it's in the, uh, it's in the fully spelt out um, expanded uh, description. But nevertheless, I would expect that there's something postsynaptic that's being, um, that's being uh, brought on by, by the plasticity, even if it would just be at the synapse. But there's every chance, and I guess that didn't come up today really, that, that there's another form of plasticity, namely some sort of intrinsic uh, change in plasticity. Um, and it, for me, it, it smells like that to me. <laughs> That's what my intuition would be. But, um, but we don't know. And then, and then, of course, it could be any or all of the ones you mentioned. So, so it, it might be a, a complex mix of those. And, and, and not to leave out also the, the synapses that inhibitory neurons as well. So, so there's, there's quite a lot of possibilities, in fact. And, and I, I, from my perspective, the importance of, of where we're at now with this study is that we know where to look. So, so if, if there is something special going on, I think we've got the, uh, the paradigm where we can isolate it and find out if these things are, in fact, happening in that location. Yeah, the experimental paradigms are pretty amazing. Uh, should be able to answer some of these questions. Um, let's see. Um, another uh, sort of specific question for you. Is there any change in the resting membrane potential when perirhinal input is blocked and or the perirhinal input is changing the conductance state of the cortical pyramidal neurons? Yes, when, when we block it, the, um, it decreases, but the, it's, it's not so much that it decreases, but that the, the paradigm uh, well, I, my best interpretation of it is that you go into a, 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 a the animal learns to go into a different brain state during the, the uh, task. And so there's elevated firing. So the, the, uh, the um, baseline firing goes up during the task in a, in a control animal. And if you, and, and, and this increases over learning. And if you block the learning with of the perirhinal input, then, then by and large, the, baseline doesn't shift. So yeah, there, there are changes in the... So I guess that um, I didn't get a chance to dwell on it, but, but what's going on is that there's a, there's a, a, a micro stimulus, meaning an extracellular stimulus of the, of the tissue um, in layer five that is repeated in a cycle of once every 10 seconds or so. Um, the, if the animal licks in a, in a window that's too close to the stimulus, then the whole um, the whole trial is aborted. So sometimes it, it, it's, uh, it, it, there's no stimulus, but basically this is turning around in, in a, not, not exactly the same time interval every time so that the, the animal can't guess when, when the next stimulus is gonna come, but basically fast enough that the, the, the animal could get into 
let's say, a, 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 a state of expectation, let's call it, that, that something is about to happen. Could I just uh, comment on the first question? Yeah, please. I ahead. think uh, one of the important things to remember is that there are likely multiple learning rules impinging on the brain. And I think there's this funny tendency we have in neuroscience to desire a sort of physics-like theory of everything. But I don't think that's, you know, uh, Larry Abbott said this to me a few years ago and I've really internalized it. That's surely not how the brain works. So you don't have to have a single learning algorithm. And I suspect that part of what's going on is that there are different types of plasticity that you can get for different types of learning. And so, you know, and local NMDA spikes in the absence of any kind of apical dendritic input are probably one way that you can do some initial clustering and unsupervised learning on sensory inputs. And then the, the apical dendrites though are what will help you to actually do something like crunch down the error on a task that requires communication with motor cortex or learn to predict things that are stored in memory, stuff like this. So, um, you know, and there's probably more than two. <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, I don't think that um, anyone, I don't know, Matthew can correct me if, if he disagrees, but I don't think anyone would say that these sorts of apical learning mechanisms are the sole means for plasticity in the brain. They probably interact with other mechanisms. Can I chime in there? Um, on, the, on the one hand, I really agree that that there's probably multiple mechanisms and, and certainly multiple timescales. Uh, so at a minimum for the different timescales, I think there'll be different mechanisms, but also probably different reasons for different mechanisms coming in. But on the other hand, I, I, I think one of the things that seems for me to go under the radar all the time, um, when, when I mean, we have this example of anterograde amnesia, where, where HM is the typical example, but I mean, basically that's, that's been repeated how many different times in different, um, different subjects and different uh, situations. The, what that's telling us, I think, apart from anything else, is that there's, there's a really dichotomous uh, signal that, so, so HM and people with, with this anterograde amnesia can can be completely normal for five minutes, and then completely forget the the the, the thing that happened, which is absolutely not like uh, a, a a a normal the, the training of a normal neural network. This is this is something special that there's some specialized mechanism that the brain uses to to capture it or not, and and it can be switched off in in the most Counterintuitive ways. If you would just be doing, let's say, gradient descent learning in a in a feed forward way, um, you, there are certain drugs that that are agonists for for GABA A receptors that can completely block learning past a certain time point, um, and and you can get anterograde amnesia by um, by the wrong kind of blow on the head, and and we don't know what. Uh, so that there's 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 something more mysterious than just multiple uh, mechanisms. So on the one hand, I think it's undoubtedly true that there are multiple mechanisms. On the other hand, there's, there's some smoking gun of, of something that happens that's, that's, that's uh, categorically different to what we are implementing in machine learning. Yeah, one of the, maybe I can ask the converse of the, the high level question here is that, uh, you know, apical dendrites have been implicated in, you know, in Matthew in, in your lab and just perception by itself without any learning as well. Whereas uh, mm -hmm. I think Blake, your kind of, uh, your model, you know, do you have a place for apical dendrites that is not learning related, uh, that is just purely an inference and perception? So in the model I discussed here, no, but I mean, I think it's undeniable that apical dendrites are also involved in inference and we have other work that we're engaged in that tries to think about how to marry these two roles for the apical dendrites um, because I, I'm sure they both exist. Yeah. Um, let me ask a high level question for all three of you. Um, uh, you know, have you seen any, this is from the uh, Q&A thing here, uh, 
Have you seen any work that tries to model network dynamics with model neurons that incorporate features like NMDA spikes, backfiring, BTSB, inhibitory neurons? Is it even possible to conduct such work now or are we missing crucial experimental data for it? Yeah. Feel free to, any of you can chime in <laughs> on that. I, would, I can't really be conclusive about machine learning world because I, I'm a novice, but, but, um, but I, I guess that uh, the, the key here is to, is to, at least from an experimentalist point of view, is to find out what the, what learning rule or each of these things translates to. Um, and, and, and that kind of going along the way that, um, that Blake was saying in his talk, in the end, we, we don't want to know this just to, just as another factoid to, to, Put on on our shelf, but but we would like to implement the right um, the right rules at the right time, and and so that wants to be encapsulated and then and then extrapolated to whatever it would mean in a in a neural network, and so that there's a there's not much on the ground at the moment, and and actually I could add more that it's it's been a little bit frustrating I should say looking at the the NMDA spike world and looking at just how hard it is to see any plasticity at all. Um, there was a, so Jackie Schiller has a couple of papers that show some interesting plasticity. Um, but, but in one case, she had to have um, BDNF uh, present to get some plasticity at the basal dendrites. And in another case, it was very strange uh, kind of flip of uh, for low frequency stimulus of the tuft, there was a sudden change in plasticity that is possibly related to potassium channels and and is is just very strange at this point. doesn't look like anything we see in a normal learning context. Um, and then there's BTSP as well, for which we also don't know the 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 substrate. So again, my, my it smells to me like there's a that there's there's some a factor that we're missing that we'll, hopefully we'll stumble across or, or we'll figure out and uh, and and i would guess that that's transformative will be transformative to mm -hmm. that if that once you would know what that factor is then there'll be well that'll be a big day and whether or not as blake suspects that would just mean a, a simple you know tune tune the model a little bit this way uh, but but basically um, nothing to see here kind of thing. It's just a, a biological uh, anecdote or whether or not that's conceptually going to change the algorithm as, as Blake puts it. it. It's I guess I would still, um, I wouldn't want to call it at this point. Yeah, Alana, you've done a great job answering all the questions on, on the Q&A. So maybe I can ask a very sort of high level one for you. You know, wh where do you want to go next with your work and are there other properties of dendritic function that you're trying to integrate in or wh where, where do you want to take your work next? Yeah, so the most immediate thing that I would like to do is uh, still in line with this idea of, um, you know, I, I'm very, in, I'd like to give a shout out to Roman Brett's uh, paper on uh, what makes a good, uh, on uh, neuron models and uh, you know, how one can take the philosophical approach of starting with something very abstracted and adding uh, properties or empirical content that you can then test uh, in an abstracted framework. That way it's kind of like uh, building up, uh, you know, what pieces, uh, what each piece you add impacts the whole system as a whole. And so, Align with that, I would like to try to, uh, I think my next step is to try to look at the activation functions um, of mm -hmm. the, the, this uh, kind of, in this morph morphological constraint setup and uh, try to understand how, you know, perhaps if I were to make that a bit more biologically realistic, how that could potentially impact performance as well. Um, it, and um, some other things that I uh, kind of really want to happen is uh, this, it, it comes from this general concept of, uh, um, you know, uh, 
building a ruler. So the task-based modeling is in a way uh, allowing me to measure uh, in some way uh, uh, how well something is able to do a particular kind of task. I want to uh, further pursue that kind of a way of thinking and trying to determine the limits of uh, how any particular dendritic property um, or how a dendrite uh, might be able to perform a particular kind of function or computation. Um, and I, I'm still working on how to implement that. It's, it's uh, proving to be a, a little challenging, but I'm sure with a bit more time and thought I can uh, try to make some steps in that direction. Also, I'm in my fourth year of PhD, so I have lots of time. You still have time. Well, <laughs> depends on Don Conrad, I guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's uh, true. To some extent, yeah. Um, do any of you want to tackle uh, Blake's big question of uh, algorithm versus implementation? Um, sure. I, I, I don't know, Jeff or others, or anyone have any uh, oh. thoughts on that? Or Matthew, go, go Can forward. I engage? On I was, yeah. um, just a couple of thoughts. Um, on the one hand, it, it, it feels a little bit like the, the, the Turing machine analogy to computers that, that uh, I think that that's kind of analogous to the, the claim that, that, that Blake is making, essentially that all computers can be, uh, that a Turing machine is universal and, and eventually we learn nothing except engineering by, by improving the chips and, and it all boils down to to the same algorithm in the end. I, I think that's, I hope that's, that, that sort of captures the, the main idea that, that in the end, that, that there's nothing that's beyond engineering that, that the brain is, is telling us. Um, and and that I, I, I think that's, that's quite likely in some sense in that, that it, it all is, there, there would be, let's say, multiple substrates or ways to implement um, dendrites. That doesn't mean that you have to, there has to be, you know, really obviously um, uh, simulation or even analogous to, to a dendrite. Um, and I think he was asking, nevertheless, the right question, do we, do we learn anything algorithmic? The, there's still some chance, as far as I can see, that, that, that we are, Missing something at, at the moment in in machine learning, well, several things. But um, I mean, in, in the first case, I would have thought we should have all learnt a lesson from the fact that just adding layers to a neural network was such a big bonus that that uh, that we went for so many years, even decades, not realizing that that they could be as powerful as they turn out to be, um, and and you could imagine that alone would be a good reason just to give it a go, as it were, see, see whether or not um, you, you don't get uh, benefits in directions that uh, you hadn't expected. But um, on, on another level, that I remember actually we, there was a fantastic um, workshop that was organized at a COSIGN conference by Blake and, and I think um, Conrad, and I can't remember who else was on the, were you part of that super time? You were definitely there. It was Tim, Tim was, uh, Tim Lillicrap was the Tim other Lillicrap, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, and, and basically the, the, this was, uh, there was workshop, it must have been six, seven years ago now, and uh, asking the same question. And I, I remember that the general feeling coming out of that was, well, it, it all boils down to learning rules and cost functions. Um, and, and that's what the, the biologists should be looking at. And because they're no use to the, to the machine learning world, unless they're they're focusing on on those things, and it, uh, what 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 kind of grates for me with that that view is that one of the things that seems to be at least to a naive observer of the machine learning world missing in most machine machine implementations, and perhaps actually not in a um, in a, a hierarchical um, network, but but what seems to be missing is is a uh, what I would want to call a semantics that's built into the actual brain, but but isn't usually in a in a neural network. In a neural network, it really doesn't matter if which neuron is 
1047. It's, it, it doesn't matter if it next week it's 1065. Whereas in the brain, it really does matter that the, the, the columns have a, a function and that's built in genetically by how they're wired. And although that you could rewire that, it's, it's not rewired. And so that means that, that there's, a, there's a, uh, a consequence of changing, let's say, getting your, your scalpel and taking out this part of the brain and not that part of the brain. And therefore there'll be consequences to, to rules that are implemented in particular parts of the brain. And it's hard to know, I, I think, a priori, where, where all the permutations of this um, pan out. So on the one hand, I think in the grand scheme of things, you should be able to reconfigure everything and so forth. Um, but but there, may be, there may be things at the algorithmic level that are going on that have to do with vision and aud audition and so on. And there may be a good thing that, that's done in the prefrontal cortex that's not completely arbitrary and completely instantiable through, through just arbitrary connections that look kind of similar. And that, 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 that in the end, that's really important to know. And that if you, if you could, that gets down in the end to maybe the, the issue that the second thing that Blake was saying that you get from dendrites, which is segregation. So if, if there are learning rules that really need to be segregated and, and you dare not just let happen everywhere in, um, all over the network, but that it really matters that the prefrontal cortex has, let's say, the possibility to fire for three seconds at a time, and, and the learning rules have to be specific to that. But, but in sensory cortex, there has to be a two-component um, chap -chap type um, uh, sequence of events, and that that's really important to the to the learning algorithm, and so on and so forth. That 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 might be what I would call algorithmic in the end, even though mm -hmm. even though. Yeah. It, Imagine it would be arbitrarily and yeah. instantial. I'll take it, since you mentioned uh, Aspen Super, I'll take a stab at that too. Um, I mean, I, I think uh, Blake, your position that um, you know we don't have to implement these things that way is, is um, a bit of a straw proposal because I, I think we all agree in the end um, that once you understand how some system works, you have a lot of variability in how you implement those algorithms. Um, I think you know today we focused on active dendrites. Um, but as as uh, uh, as we just heard, is there's a huge amount of very detailed complexity throughout the brain with specific types of neurons connecting very specific types of ways, as Matthew was suggesting, and we are just scratching the surface of these algorithms. We we are just scratching the surface. You know, the algorithms that implement in deep learning networks, say, are convolutional neural networks, are just maybe one percent of the kind of algorithms that exist in the brain, and as valuable as they are. And, um, and so I think the risk of focusing too much on um, this issue of what's, how do you implement these things, is that some people take it as a sign that I don't need to worry about the biology. You know, I don't have to worry about those things. If, if I may comment on that, because um, yeah. I also unfortunately have to run for another meeting. Uh, but because um, I think this is, is a key point that you just made, Jeff, and I, I want to clarify the position that I'm taking here. Um, so, and this also relates to this, what Matthew was saying. I, I'm not suggesting that AI should ignore the brain, nor am I suggesting that we have already got everything we need in AI yeah. and it's all good to go. What I'm suggesting is that the way in which dendrites are gonna help us in AI is that in studying dendrites, we're going to come to better understand the algorithms of the brain. When we better understand the algorithms of the brain, we can then use that information to inform the development of AI. But when we do that, when we take the algorithms that we have uncovered from the brain and we go to implement them in AI, I'm not convinced that we're going to have to implement those algorithms with dendrites, even if dendrites were key to our understanding the algorithms that we're I think I with. totally agree with you. I 100% I, I, I agree. I, I just I just know from experience that not everyone is, is, is as enlightened as you are. And the, <laughs> they will, they, a lot of people just jump to the next conclusion, which you already dismissed, which is that maybe we don't have to pay attention to these things. And um, it, it, it's just surprising how often I have to remember people that, uh, remind people that way. Just, just before you go, I just, just, I, wanna, I just want to make one more point about the algorithm. Yeah. You know, there's a huge part of neuroscience these days focused on 
uh, algorithms that are in the hippocampal complex. These are place yeah. cells, grid cells, hydrogen cells, very specific types of cells, very specific type of operations. The whole set of algorithms, and slew of algorithms that are really interesting and fascinating and complex that, you know, that aren't into any of the standard AI neural networks today. And so that's just a hint of, <laughs> you know, how far we are from knowing all these algorithms. Oh, totally. And, uh, yeah. So anyway, I think I'm agreeing with you. I just didn't want to. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'm agreeing with you as well. I, yeah, I just, we are I so far from encapsulating yeah. all those algorithms that exist in the brain. Yeah, so some, some people just re reach the wrong conclusion. I didn't say yeah. you did, but I know some people do. No, of course, it's an important there's, point of clarification. There's, yeah. there's another level on which you might find that it does turn out that you want to implement something like a dendrite and call it something like a dendrite. And that would be in the realm of, uh, let's say, it, it, it's object-oriented coding turns out to be a good way to organize your thoughts when you code without necessarily changing the algorithms under that, um, that, that are, that mm -hmm. it, it may be that by organizing the, the structure of your network into, with segregated inputs onto dendrites, that, that you can, that you can better think about, about what operations are in fact being done and better tune your, your network. In which case you'd be arguing, I think the same thing that you're arguing, Blake, but still calling them dendrites just, just because it becomes a useful. Yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah. And it's the same way we call the units in ANN's neurons. I mean, yeah, yeah, not yeah, yeah, neurons. Yeah. And it's kind and, of silly and, and to some say, neurons, but. You can argue that's beneficial because we all have a common language, but on the other hand, right. it's really bad because they mean something completely different yeah. about that term yeah. neuron. So it's, exactly. a, it's a language problem as much as anything. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much, everyone. I'm, I'm afraid I do have to run because I had booked something for three because that was the original time, I thought. Well, anyway, thanks, for um, thanks for going over. Like, really great to have this was that. really thanks, fun. Great. great to see you all. Great to see you, Matthew, Alana, Subutai, yeah, and I hope it. I can meet yeah. others in person. I, I think we're close to the end here anyway. Yeah, right? I, I think okay. thank, thank you bye all bye. for all three of you for joining. And I guess we could take this onto Twitter. Uh -huh. Thank you, Alana. <laughs> I'll carry thank on you, the Matthew. discussion. There. there are actually a lot of great questions here, and, and we didn't get a chance to apologize to the people who are asking, but hopefully, I know Alana has answered a lot of them and Matthew answered a few of them. But... Uh, can I still get at them or do they go when this, when this goes? Um, I don't know what happens actually. Um, I wasn't really paying attention to the... <laughs> yeah, the I think they the disappear yeah. actually, unfortunately. Uh, um, we could try to, I think we actually get it in our recording and maybe we can uh, convey them in some fashion and maybe we can answer them on Twitter or on the meetup page or, or something like that. So I, I think you can just, uh, you know, uh, control all copy and put it in email if you want. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll try doing that. Uh, I don't think they will be in the recording. I well, create... normally the chat is in the recording, um, but I did, I did just do what Jeff suggested, copy and paste it. So we'll have, we'll have that. Um, There's some really difficult questions there. I'm, I'm not sure uh, I, I no. should even attempt them. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is an optional exercise, Matthew, so I know yeah. these things can be burdens, you know. Oh yeah. my God, well, I have to all this. Yeah, questions. Alana, any last thoughts from you on, on some of the discussion? Or? I mean, I, I very much appreciate the discussion and it's been a pleasure to uh, be part of it. Um, I would guess that uh, I, I just think that if we're going to try to understand uh, where things are coming from, how they fit together and things like that, we really need to think about constraints uh, in that, uh, especially if we're going to be applying or borrowing from deep learning or using deep learning to apply, uh, uh, using deep learning to apply to neuroscience, we need to use neuroscience to constrain our uh, deep learning um, uh, approaches, at least to better understand where, like, what is actually happening in neuroscience, if not necessarily to, uh, you know, make deep learning better. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm a neuroscientist first and foremost, deep learning uh, uh, scientist second. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's exactly, I mean, we, that's a lot of our work on Nementa is based on exactly that premise. You know, we, we need to take the constraints from neuroscience and apply it because we know those, the brain works remarkably well with those constraints. We um, use that. We use that exact word right all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to hear. Exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. Um, okay. Anything else? Uh, um, we're done. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Alana. Uh, thank you. Thank you.
uh, Blake. We'll look, look forward to but, seeing you all in, 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 in the flesh sometime in the future. Yeah, yeah. and maybe we'll have like another week. session to sort of continue the discussion uh, in, a, in a future forum. So. Yeah, I would love to come over to California to meet with everyone. <laughs> Great. I'd uh, love to have you here. I love the trip. Once, well, yeah, once the fires are gone. <laughs> <laughs> and the pandemic. And the pandemic. Yeah. Oh, good, yeah. The pandemic, the fire. Our, our office is empty right now. And, and thank you, Matthew. I know it's late. Uh, yeah, it's great. Yeah, thank I really appreciate that. It. It's no, great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Yeah. I'm a, all right. All right. Take care, everyone.